As I always do, welcome uh, everybody. I just want to also express uh, uh, thanks to our virtual uh, audience. Uh, you know, I know we have people watching online. We want them to know that we appreciate their presence, their virtual presence. So let me read the introduction. Uh, this is a very interesting letter. Uh, one of the so-called authentic letters of Paul, and this is going to be the last one. We've probably studied about, done about 12 sessions in total. Uh, and so that's kind of almost three months we've been on Paul. And still there's a lot to do on Paul. We, 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 we cannot exhaust, um, you know, uh, this great uh, uh, exponent or great uh, uh, writer of the New Testament uh, scriptures for us. The letter to the Galatians is unique among Paul's letters in the sense that Paul shows his anger and frustration at the recipient. So that's something that, uh, you know, the first line is something that is going to come th out throughout the discussion. And you see it. The Galatians have aroused Paul's eye uh, in a manner not found anywhere else in Paul's letters, in the Pauline corpus and have incurred a scathing and blistering rebuke from him. Look, you know, look at um, uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 6, and then I'll jump to chapter 3, verse 1. But if you have your Bibles, your tablets, just turn with me to Galatians chapter 1. And let me read from verse 6. Galatians 1, beginning at verse 6. Look at uh, what Paul is saying, the kind of blistering and the scathing um, you know, rebuke that Paul offers them here. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are returning to a different gospel. Not that there is another, God, another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. And here Paul actually makes this, uh, if you like, puts himself on the oath and and calls on, on this uh, uh, curse, if you like. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be an anathema. Let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again. He makes a, you know, a, a repetition of that. He repeats it. If anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you receive, let him be accursed. Look at chapter 3, verse 1. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law? or by the hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain? If indeed it was in vain. And then he goes on. So you can see, I said, this is one of the letters that Paul uses this, you know, you foolish, you know, Galatians. Something isn't right. Paul is not happy about what's going on. Back to my outline. Paul's anger with the Galatians is so deep that for the first time in his writing, here's another thing that I want you to take notice. Paul breaks with convention by omitting words of thanksgiving for the recipients. In fact, this is the only letter of Paul that doesn't have thanksgiving to God for the congregation. If you look at all the others, I'll give you some examples. The Romans, you have it. You know, First Corinthians, Second Corinthians, you know, Philippians, First Thessalonians, and Philemon, which we've all we've looked at all of them. Paul is not prepared, so here we go, to engage in any civil dialogue with either his opponents who were peddling a false gospel, as far as he's concerned, or the Galatians who have allowed themselves to be swayed by Paul's detractors. It appears that Paul finds something commendable about the Galatians in chapter 5, uh, 4, 12 to 15, yet he is dumbfounded by their folly. So the question is, 
Why is Paul so incensed with the Galatians? That's the question that we're trying to find out. And you'll find out why Paul is so angry with the church in Galatia and that he comes just swinging hard. He, he, he leaves no stone unturned. He's just going to get at them. You know, and that's what you're going to find. But before we do that, let's find out why was this letter written? What was the occasion? What was the purpose? So again, I have uh, something there for you just by way of summary, a couple of paragraphs there. After Paul converted several Gentiles to faith in Christ in the region of Galatia, other missionaries arrived on the scene, insisting that believers must follow parts of the Jewish law to be fully right before God or with God. Specifically, the men in these congregations had to accept the, you know, the Jewish rite of circumcision. Let's go to chapter 5, verse you know, Galatians. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. And then I'll read from verse 2 to verse 6. And then I'll go to chapter 6 and verse 12. Galatians 5, begin at verse 1. For freedom, Christ has set us free. One of the key uh, themes in this letter is freedom, liberty. In fact, Galatians is usually referred to as the Magna Carta of, of Christian liberty uh, in the New Testament. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look. I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ for uh, uh, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through the law. So this is really the situation that Paul is so upset about. Those who are elevating you know, the Jewish right, particularly that of, you know, peritomes, you know, circumcision, that you need to be circumcised if you're, uh, you know, male. And uh, obviously, um, if you're female, maybe you need to marry into the, uh, you know, Jewish, um, um, you know, faith or Jewish tradition. So Paul is not very happy here. In chapter 6 and verse 12, let me read what Paul says in chapter 6 and verse 12. Uh, let me start from verse 11. See with what large letters I'm writing to you with my own hand. We've seen this in some of the letters that we studied. Paul sometimes will kind of issue an autograph, you know, like my own handwriting, which, supposed, um, which tells me that maybe he used some secretaries or some assistants to help him. But then he'll say, look how big I'm writing. Maybe at this time either his eyesight was getting dim. So he said, look, I'm writing these large letters in my own hand. Look at uh, verse 12. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. This is Paul's take on all these things, that they are not even genuine themselves. You know, this kind of got under Paul's skin, this whole idea, and we're going to find out what Paul is doing, and uh, you know, there are some good things about Paul is not saying the law is, is bad, no, in, in, in Romans chapter 12, uh, 7, 12, the law is holy, righteous, and just. The law is good, uh, but Paul here finds something that he wasn't happy as far as the, the Galatians were concerned. Back to my um, um, handout there. The Galatians appear to have been persuaded by Paul's opponents, as we read in chapter 1, verses 69. According to Paul, his opponents were teaching that a person must perform the works 
prescribed by the Jewish law to have salvation. This message, Paul contends, completely contradicts everything that Paul has been telling them and that which led them to faith in Christ in the first place. That is, a person is justified not by doing the works of the law, but by having faith in Jesus Christ. This is the, the theme of the letter. Go with me to chapter 2, verse 15 and 16. Galatians chapter 2, verse 15 and 16. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. So that's how they looked at Gentiles. They were sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified or righteous or put in a good standing by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law because by the works of the law no one will be justified. In other words, doing the works of the law will not put you in a right standing, in a right relationship. In fact, he begins by saying we ourselves are Jews by birth and we are not Gentile sinners. So there's a distinction between us. But you know, when Paul says something like this, he begins to actually um, you know, argue in a way that brings everything together. And yet he says, but we know that we just cannot mechanically obey the law and be put in a right standing with God, as far as Paul is concerned, his understanding of justification by faith. Again, there's nothing wrong with the law, but Paul is saying based on his understanding now, and we're going to talk about it, he believes that uh, this is the way it should be. Paul was absolutely outraged at this proposal. He found it ludicrous that, you know, they will be teaching that, you know, by following the law, everything will be okay. In his view, gentle circumcision, as far as Paul is concerned, from what I got, was an affront to God and a rejection of justification, of the justification God has provided through Jesus Christ. Those who propose such a thing have perverted the gospel. Chapter 1, verses 6 to 7. And are cursed by God. Verse 8. His opponents, this wasn't the only thing that they took Paul to task on, but his opponents also questioned, we talked about this at length in some of our uh, earlier discussions, Paul's authority to proclaim the gospel. Paul, we know Peter, we know James. We know these early apostles. Were you even an apostle? Did you see Jesus? Were you part of the, the, the original? So this was another issue that, you know, uh, Paul wasn't very happy about. And he has a whole discussion in chapter 1, beginning at verse 10 to 24, uh, you know, which you can read. So Paul comes out. He is at his most combative in this letter. He comes, you know, really, really, you know, um, uh, you know, swinging the bat here. So this is really what we're going to talk about. I don't know if there are any questions at this point, any comments before we get into, uh, you know, the uh, actual, you know, text. But this is kind of a summary. This is what we're going to talk about, about what Paul is doing in this, uh, in this book. There are other discussions about was it northern Galatia, southern Galatia, other cities, but those are things that uh, we'll talk about in the seminary. I don't think we uh, we need to uh, bother ourselves at this point. So let's try now and look at the, you know, the text itself, why Paul is saying what he's saying and what, you know, he, um, the evidence he abuses to support his, uh, the points he's making. So Paul, at the beginning of this letter, makes a case against his opponents. Look at chapter 1, verse 1. I, Paul, he qualifies it, an apostle. And then look at what he says. Not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me. So, first of all, he makes this important point. I am an apostle, but my apostleship did not come through anybody 
kind of you know, giving me that uh, authentication or whatever. It came from God himself. And so I have a right to call myself an apostle. And so that's what he begins with. And then he obviously goes into rebuking the, uh, the Galatians for adopting another gospel, as we read, from, you know, different from more than what he preached to them. Obviously, we does, Paul doesn't specify what the other gospel entails at this point. He doesn't make that clear, but at least we can do some reconstruction. We can deduce, uh, obviously, from uh, what he's talking about as far as circumcision is concerned. Paul then devotes nearly two chapters, uh, you know, part of chapter one and then part of chapter two and three, to some kind of autobiographical uh, sketch of his earlier life and his conversion through a direct act of God. And so if you start from verse 11 of chapter 1, let's go there. Let me read a few things from there, uh, and then uh, uh, we will continue. The Galatians 1, begin at verse 11. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not from man's gospel. It's not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, Repeating what he said in uh, verse 1 of chapter 1. Um, Nor was I taught, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. We know the road to Damascus. Obviously, good. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. Verse 14. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age. In other words, his peers. Among my people. So extremely zealous. You remember we talked about this in Philippians chapter 3. You know, where he gave another kind of uh, autobiographical sketch of his life. How I advanced uh, in Judaism uh, beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. Verse 15. But when he who had set me apart before I was born, and who called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me, in order that I may preach him among the Gentiles. Now this was Paul's main preoccupation, to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. You will get that in the book of Acts. You know, Luke's account, and then in almost all his letters, but particularly here in Galatians. So that was what he wanted to do. I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. What was he doing in Arabia? We don't have any evidence. Maybe we may know something about it, some suggestions. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. In what I'm writing to you before God, I do not lie. He puts himself under oath here. I'm telling you everything. So this is really Paul's own, you know. So here is the case. Unfortunately, we don't have Peter's side of the story to kind of compare. We only have Paul's side. So uh, obviously uh, we just have to accept that. He continues. Um, then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only, they only were hearing it said, he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy, and they glorify God because of me. Well, I think they were scared. Paul is saying they glorified, but there were some who had their doubts. Is this guy truly, genuinely converted? Is he not coming here to maybe do what he used to do? So there were some, some concerns. I would be concerned. Oh, yeah, we've got to be honest. And so at least we can read in between the lines that Things were not really kosher here, were not smooth. There were those who were not really sure what to do with Paul. And particularly, Paul coming in and saying, well, I'm taking the gospel to the Gentiles, and then the Gentiles would not even have to obey the Jewish law. Uh, you know, people will not be comfortable with that. 
And so we need to kind of uh, uh, be thinking about these things as we go through this. So this is what is going on uh, here. Uh, uh, Paul does not deny that he had some contact with the Jerusalem apostles. Obviously, 14 years later, he met with a larger group of the apostles to inform them of his missionary activities in chapter 2, 1 to 10. Because of time, we will not be able to read through all that. It appears to be his second trip to Jerusalem, maybe a third one, according to the book of Acts, chapter 15, where he came to, um, or he attended the council in Jerusalem. This visit represents a critical moment for the Gentile mission. Paul went to convince the Jerusalem apostles that Gentiles were not required to follow the Jewish law, including circumcision, to be right with God or to be justified with God. And then he met with the leaders privately to persuade them of his own view. And I think that he seemed to have succeeded a little bit, even though there were some who were not uh, obviously completely convinced by what Paul was doing. And Paul, you know, those who disagreed with him, he calls them dissenters, because chapter uh, 2 and verse 4. Paul then provides some autobiographical detail to secure this point. Particularly that incident with um, uh, Peter. Turn with me to chapter 2, verse 11 to verse 14. Let me read this story. It's kind of interesting. In Galatians 2, begin at verse 11. But when Cephas, that is Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Again, I said, we don't have Peter to defend himself here. So this is really what uh, Paul is saying, that there was this uh, incident in Antioch, and obviously that um, uh, didn't go well between uh, Peter and, 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 and Paul. And so we, I said we don't know much about this, but obviously uh, following this incident uh, over the matter of John Mark, again, Acts chapter 15, there were some other the things that actually happened. Paul and Barnabas split up. Uh, and then this marked the beginning of Paul's second missionary journey when he revisited the churches uh, in southern Galatia and did his first missionary work in Galatia proper, maybe somewhere to the north. Again, I said the discussion between north and south of Galatia is something that we would not touch on uh, at this point. We are not privy to the outcome of this confrontation, in part because we never hear Cephas' side of the story. However, it introduces the issue that the letter is ultimately about, the relationship of the gospel to the Jewish law. Now, according to Paul, none is justified by doing the works of the law, but only through faith in Christ. That is what God has done through Jesus Christ. If a person could be made right with God through the law, then there would have been no reason for Christ to die, Paul argues. Paul argues in chapter 2, verses 18 to 19, that through a correct understanding, his own understanding of the law, he's given up on the law as a way of being justified before God. And then he even uh, takes uh, Father Abraham, and he says, Ibn Abraham, the, if you like, the progenitor of the Hebrew race, if you like, uh, the father um, of all believers, exercised faith in God. And so in chapter 3, verse 69, and then obviously um, uh, 28 to 29, the allegory of um, uh, uh, using Haggai and, um, uh, and, and using um, you know, one of our fathers is all there. And I, again, we can talk about it if you want us to discuss that. 
Now, this perspective is especially clear in the allegory of chapter 4, verse 21 to, to, to you know, 30. Again, you can reference that to Genesis 21. In fact, no one can obey all the demands of the law. The Galatians' attempts to obey the law put them under the curse of the law itself. In chapter 3 and verse 10. Scripture itself indicates that a person will find life only through faith in Jesus Christ. Quoting Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4. So turn with me to uh, chapter 3. Let me read from verse 10 to verse um, 14. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. I'm reading Galatians 3 verse 10. For it is written, curse be everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. The one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Curse is everyone who is hung on a tree from Deuteronomy. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessings of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. And then you can go down and read the um, allegory uh, of Hagar and, 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 and obviously um, Isaac. So, this is really what this letter is telling us. So the question then comes, what was the purpose of the law? If Paul is saying that the law can't take us to God, it's all by faith in God, then what is the purpose of the law? That's something that I want us to spend some time you know, talking about. Um, one, of, one of the uh, verses that I, uh, I mentioned, let me uh, go there and find out, and then I can read to you because um, it's so important. In Romans chapter 7, verse 12. In fact, Romans chapter 7, from verse 7 going, Paul talks about the law and sin, and then he makes this point, which I want to read to you. I, I mentioned it. In Romans chapter 7, let me read from verse 11 to verse 12. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. But then he says, but the law is holy, the commandment is holy, and righteous and good. The God who gave the law is a holy God, is a good God, is a righteous God. And so the law itself is good. There's nothing wrong with it. But Paul is saying, what was the purpose of the law for Paul's own understanding? So look at that uh, last but one heading uh, on page two. Paul answers this question in Galatians chapter 3, verses 19 to 29. So let's go there, and let me read through this and listen to what Paul is saying about the purpose of the law, so that at least we know, uh, you know what Paul is saying. So, Galatians chapter 3, begin at verse 19. Why then the law? Why? Paul is asking this question. It was added because of transgression until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Going back to the Old Testament, as you know. Now, an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God Absolutely not. Meganeto. No, contrary. That's not okay. Paul is saying no. For if a law has been given that could give life, then righteousness could indeed be by the law. But the scriptures imprisoned everyone under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the, coming, uh, until the coming faith would be revealed. So then, so here we go. This is some kind of explanation that Paul is giving about the law. Now listen to this. So then, the law was our guardian 
until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ Jesus have put on Christ. Going back to Romans chapter 6, he makes this you know, similar statement, almost you know, verbatim. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are, uh, you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, as according to the promise. So, let me ask you, what do you think Paul is saying here? What is the purpose of the law? What, what's your take? What do you understand about what's, you know, what Paul is saying? Yes, Sam, let me give you this so that our virtual uh, group can hear what's we're discussing. Thank you. I think uh, it was good because the Jews in the law um, were godly people and they believed in God and they did the right things right. and they, they made up the law themselves and so forth. The law was given to them. As you know, well, uh, as, as you said here, yeah, through right. Moses, huh? Right, through Moses and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, by man. Right. But anyway, and that man, and Moses, of course, was uh, influenced by God. So, you know, that's a good start. Yeah. I mean, he didn't go directly to non believers. I mean, he did. He was trying to get the Gentiles yeah. to believe in a God. Yeah. And then Jesus came along, and then. <laughs> Paul was hit with a two by four. Okay. And uh, then he said, oh, well, okay. I guess I wasn't doing the right thing. And then uh, he totally believed uh, what Jesus was saying. Okay. And that's what he's trying to say. And he, I think this sums it up. Right. You know, a person is justified not by doing the works of the law, right. but by having faith in Christ. And that's, that's the whole uh, Galatians. Yeah, that's correct. That's the, that's the crux of the matter. that's what it's all yeah. about. That's mm -hmm. what he's saying. Right. Okay. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Any other reflections about, um, you know, the law um, and Paul? You know, Paul uses a word here. Uh, and I try to put that in uh, kind of a trans transliterated for you. I use the word pedagogos. Uh, let me read through that a little bit and you see what I'm saying. Um, it is best to understand Paul's comments to mean that the law was given to provide instruction and guidance. And by the way, the, the, the name Torah means, we call it do, you know, law, but Torah actually means instruction. Yeah, that's really, because God took the people of Israel and he instructed them. He gave them the Torah. He gave them the law to guide them, to you know, you know, prepare them. And so we also uh, need that, in, you know, that guidance, that instruction. Informing them of God's will and keeping them, so here we go, in line until God came to fulfill his promise to Abraham, quote uh, what uh, Paul is saying, to bless his offspring, chapter 3, verse 16, to bless the offspring of, uh, uh, of Abraham. This fulfillment, Paul uh, uh, argues, um, come uh, or came in Christ, God's revelation of himself. Thus, the law served as a disciplinarian, pedagogus. And I tried to uh, uh, kind of explain that in uh, one line there. Literally, a boy leader, usually a slave who conducts the freeborn uh, youth to and from school and superintends his conduct. And so you kind of make sure that the youth walks in the straight and narrow, you know, so Paul is using this analogy here that the law was a, like this pedagogus that guided the, the, the children of Israel. Uh, and so it, it was, if you like, a means to an end. It wasn't an end by itself. That's the argument Paul is making. Um, I don't know if you agree with him, um, but he's saying that, that the law had its place. And the law was actually uh, given so that we could look forward to the end, the telios of the law, which is Jesus Christ himself. 
Uh, unfortunately, um, that's not how uh, he, Paul, perceives his own people understanding you know, the law. So the law has a place. There's nothing wrong with the, with the law. You know, I always give this analogy. If I'm walking through this double doors here and I come up and there's a sign, no smoking. Now, if I'm not a smoker, I'm not under the law. I just walk through. Is that not right? Because I don't have anything there to snuff out or anything. So, to me, there's no law. I just, I just walk through and I come in. Okay, all right. But you see, but if I'm a smoker, I got to stop because that, that's, there's something that that's telling me. So Paul is saying, look, the law was given to guide us, instruct us, to really bring us, you know, together and, and show us, you know, the way. But, you know, it is always difficult. You know, when you have something that, like, checks and balances, it becomes really difficult. It's like telling a little boy, don't touch that box. The moment you say, don't touch that box, it's all over. Because the, 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 the curiosity, what is it in there that daddy is saying I shouldn't touch? You come closer, you won't touch it. You come a little bit closer, and then, what, what is in there? Because you've already aroused this kid, and then the next, then it, the whole thing is, is open, is over. You know, that's how it is. I think for us, you know, it, it's kind of, the, the, the law picked our curiosity and I wouldn't blame people who wanted to amplify it and amplify it because they thought that it couldn't say everything for them. And so they had to make it. But in the course of doing that, it became a, a little bit of a burden. And so for Paul, he says, look, I don't think we need all these checks and balances. They're good. But Jesus is the end of the law. So when we go to Jesus, it's all good. So let me um, summarize what uh, Paul says, and I will stop and we'll have some discussion. Does Paul's teaching then lead to lawlessness? If Paul says, no more law, can we accuse Paul of being lawless? So here's my little paragraph. Now, if the law was given to provide direction and discipline, instruction to God's people, but Gentile believers don't have to keep it, are they not liable to turn to wild and reckless behavior? For Paul, nothing could be farther from the truth. Paul, you know, in part of his, you know, you know paranesis or admonitions or exhortations in chapter 5 going, Paul is saying that Christ has set us free. And we are all, you know, to come to him in love. And so in chapter 5 and verse 13, look at what Paul is saying. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. For the whole law, so here we go. The whole law, the entire law. Is summed up in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Talking about people, but we know the law is summed up, you know, love to God, love to fellow human being. Because you love God, you love your other, you know, person. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. And so, Paul is saying that the whole law is summed up in this one commandment. We love our neighbor as ourselves. Believers whose lives are empowered by the Spirit will bear the fruit or will bear fruit in ways that fulfill the law and do those things that, are, that, the law, that no law forbids. And so in chapter 5, verses 22 to 23, let me go there and, 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 and see what Paul is saying. Actually, let me start from uh, verse 16 of chapter 5. But I say to you, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the, the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, 
idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissension, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like this. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is, and some preachers make this you know, singular, the fruit. So one, one, one fruit. But then you, you know, when you put it all together, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. So my analogy, if you are a person of love and, you know, you are at peace with everybody. Uh, there was this little uh, poster that I had years ago. It's a little kitten that's killed on, on a plant uh, on a porch that is actually outside the house. And it was asleep, fast gone. And then underneath it, everywhere you are at peace with yourself is home. It spoke so much to me. Everywhere you were at peace, this kitten killed and it was asleep. It was comfortable. In other words, when we manifest the fruit of the Spirit, a there, then obviously we are at peace with one another. In fact, Paul talks about this. Let me just uh, remind us, because we did this in Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 4. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we also have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint. This really, I like this one. Hope does not disappoint or put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. And so Paul is saying to us that, you know, the whole law is summed up in this you know, commandment, love to God, of course, love to your fellow human being. And that if we do that, then we are led by the Spirit. And that once we are led by the Spirit, we are not ruled by the flesh. And that when we do that, we are not doing anything that is contrary to the law and the will of God. And so Paul uses that and says, so the law is good. Jews and Gentiles are part of God's you know, plan and we come together as one people, the people of God, and we are united through Jesus Christ. My last verse that I'll read will be from the book of Ephesians about Jesus Christ and what Paul says about him in Ephesians chapter 2. Paul, you know, says all this about Jesus Christ. And, and I, 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 I like this because, you know, it talks about uh, what Jesus, what God has done for us in, in Jesus Christ. Um, in Ephesians chapter 2, and Paul uh, makes this point here um, about we being dead in our trespasses and that we, uh, you, know, we are, you know, we are united in Christ because Christ is the peace of God and in him we don't have, uh, you know, anything to worry about. So let me read a few verses from, from Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, begin at verse 4. But God being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive, zopoyo, together with Jesus Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised up with him and seated with us uh, with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one 
may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, with which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And then Paul, in verse 11 to verse 15 of the same chapter, Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But look at verse 13 and 14. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, you Gentiles, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And verse 14, I'm going to end here. For he, Jesus, himself, is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Praise God that Jesus Christ is our peace, who brings all of us together. Isn't that powerful? So Paul is saying, the law is good, but the one that we need to look up to is Jesus Christ, who is your peace and my peace. And he brings us together. The law has its place. It was good, but with the coming of Jesus, we are all united in him. Let me stop here. Any comment, any question uh, before we bring our time to a close? Any question that you have? Any comment? Yes, Kathy. Yeah, at, at the book club, we just uh, read um, The Simple Faith of Mr. Rogers. Right. And it was so good, but he lived his life trying to, you know, do this, um, love your neighbor as yourself. And he tried to see each person as, as God, as part of God or a creation of God. Yeah. So he valued each person. And try, he said, how we see others, or how we see ourselves, is how we're going to look at others. So first right. we see ourselves, you know, as saved and loved Amen. and cherished. Right. Uh, but it's really a good book. Right. Thank you. You know, it's, it's a good point you're making because, you know, when we see ourselves as people dignified in God, with dignity, then we will treat others the same. And that's the point because, you know, Paul is saying, in Christ, we are all one. And so we treat each other as the family members of God. We are in this together. It is true that if somebody has hatred in them, sometimes it's because they're having their own struggle. And we may not be privy to that. You know, and we, you know, we need to be praying for, for that individual because sometimes people react based on what is going on inside of them. You know, so Paul is saying, and as Kathy, you rather said, when we all believe that we are all one in Christ, dignified in him, redeemed by him, made by him, and we are all one. That's what Paul is saying in Christ Jesus. In the Galatians, you know, chapter 3, verse 27, 28, there's no Jew or Gentile, there's no male or female, there's no bond or free. In Christ, we are all one people. I think that is a very important, you know, point. Uh, John, I can say you want to add something to it. Thank you. You know, uh, as Daniel said, uh, Jesus is the end of the law, and he's the one we should strive to be like, but we're not judged if we don't get there. No. But at the same time, in all of Paul's writings and in Galatians, he regularly references what's called the holiness code of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm and warns people, if you do these things, you're not going to heaven and you're not saved. Right. And it's not a contradiction because he goes on to say in, in, that, in chapter five, if you really have the Holy Spirit, you won't do those things. Yeah. You don't need a law no. because God lives within you yeah. and constantly reminds you of right. what is or is not correct. Yeah. But in the end of the letter, he said, God is not mocked. And if you're doing those things, right. be aware you don't have the Holy Spirit. Right. It's a uh, it's cautionary tale. Yeah. <laughs> I like that, John. Appreciate that. That's a good point. 
In fact, I think with that note, uh, I can, you know, just to agree with what John has said. So Paul writes in Galatians chapter 2, verse 19 and 20, 19 to 21. Let this be the last verse I'm going to read. Galatians chapter 2, verses 19 to 21. For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives, uh, Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God. If righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. So, down to God's grace. The law is good, but as John Ryder said, you know, and we cannot fully be like God or, you know, be holy. We live in a broken world. There's no question about it. And Paul is not calling upon us, nor is God saying you need to be perfect all the time. No. In, 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 in Matthew 5, 48, be ye perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. It's be complete. Wholeness. And wholeness comes, we know, through you know, you know, God himself. So at no point are we called to be perfect because you know, we hang on to the cocktails of Jesus Christ. And I think that is something very important. So whether it's the law, whatever it is, it's all because of what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, please. Almighty God, we thank you so much for this uh, study and for the enlightenment and the insights that you've given us. There's so much to learn, and I know we only scratch the surface. So help us, Father, to be good students, diligent students of your word, and that through your spirit, may you, Father, enlighten our hearts and minds and give us the desire to share these uh, important truths of our salvation with those who need to hear. As we transition to our worship service, Father, may you touch our hearts and may you fill us with your spirit and give us your special blessing, we pray, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, John.